Welcome to PVPN. I am your local realtor and host, Joe Alessi. And today we have the girls varsity tennis coaches from Peninsula Panthers. And we're really excited to delve into their program today. So again, thank you both for coming today. I'm really excited to talk about the tennis program. Uh, so we have Barbara DeWitt and Mike Hager, coaches of the Peninsula Panthers varsity girls team. And what I'd love to do is just get a sense today, you know, what it's like to be a coach in today's environment, how the program maybe has changed over time and tennis in general, you know, how things are going with the league play so far and you know, how you see things hopefully playing out in, uh, when, once playoffs come. So uh, let's start off a little broad because in general, the tradition on the peninsula for tennis is really strong for girls tennis, especially, right? We can go all the way back to the seventies when Tracy Austin was at Rolling Hills High School, which is now Peninsula High. And as we all know, I think she still holds the record for being 16 years old and winning the US Open. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, yeah. right. Correct. And then we can come all the way to today's game and you have, uh, uh, Ina Shibahara, right, who has gone on to the circuit. Is she play doubles? She's, is she a doubles player? She, yes, she is a doubles player. I think she's currently ranked fourth in the world. Yeah, that's and, phenomenal. Uh, so, yeah, she's, we're very proud of her. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I bet you are. <laughs> yeah, all four years. You take full credit yes, for her right. success. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah. Um, so, and then of course, going to the other schools as well, uh, at Palos Verdes High School, you had the Sampras family. Stella Sampras is there. I believe she coaches at UCLA mm -hmm. currently. And then again, I always like to go back to Merrill West High School, the Marauders. Uh, I graduated in 1984 and the tennis program was strong back then as well. And Kim Poe was on the uh, girls tennis and she went on to win Wimbledon uh, as well. So we have a lot of great tradition on the hill for tennis, which you know puts a lot of pressure a little bit on the program, or no? Does it, do you feel pressure because of that tradition, or? No, I don't think so uh, anymore. I mean, we we've been able to continue with our success in the last twenty years that I've been there. Uh, I think getting the first CIF championship after, well, in the nineties, Tom Cox was the coach, and the three schools came together to form. Palos Verdes Peninsula High School. All the other schools thought this isn't fair because as you said, Mirrorless, Rolling Hills, PV High, were all winning CIF championships individually. Right. And now you came together and created one powerhouse right. team. So there was a time in the 90s, uh, they won uh, nine out of 10 years, Peninsula won the CIF. Uh, they had a 125 game win streak, which was the best in the country. Um, so Tom Cox was the coach then. Um, so um, I joined him at the end in uh, 98. Um, and then when he retired in 2002, uh, then when I was all by myself, then it felt like I got to get a championship <laughs> uh, to continue the uh, tradition. Um, so we did get a few and I think that takes the pressure off. And then, you know, you, you always want to win, right? right. But, um, but there are other things too. You're right. Yeah. We have we have the, one of the largest programs in the area, and we're proud of that. And we've had coaches tell us you can't win if you have 60, 70 players mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. your program. And somehow we can have 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. We want every um, every high school kid to wear a jersey of some kind. And if it's a tennis jersey, that's great. So we try to keep a big program. Okay. But we also want to win. Yeah. And we course. can do. We found out we can do both. Yeah. And that's ideal, for that's sure. Right. Uh, you, you touched on winning CIF all those years. Uh, can you talk about, there's a CIF, but is there also a state level uh, um, competition that there, happens There isn't as well? a true state tournament. They've, they're still working on that, but they do have a state regional that they introduced about 10 years ago. And uh, that includes the San Diego schools and the Fresno schools, but not the Bay Area schools. Um, so there are some other uh, tournaments that you can go to early in the season. There's um, uh, another group that runs a tournament where all the best teams try to come 
it's actually more of a true state tournament. Um, mm -hmm. We've won that a couple times. Um, but we do have 16 CIF championships. Um, and I, there were three in a row that we won when Enna Shibahara was playing. Mm -hmm. But I think what most people forget is, so Enna went to UCLA and then uh, turned pro, is that we had six other Division I players on that team. You can't just win <coughs> with one player. Right. You, you need nine. So we had um, uh, Kennedy Hans, who went to the University of Washington on a full ride. And we had Risa Nakagawa that went to Georgetown, and we had uh, Tia, Tia El Poussin and, and Sarah Katab, who went to UC Riverside. So you really, you really need the depth. And, um, right. and so that's, uh, that was Enna's years. Um, yep. Yeah. You know, and, and we'll touch on, uh, you played Palos Verdes High School. And by the way, just for those out there, we invited Palos Verdes High School as well. And we wanted them to be here, but there were some conflicts on scheduling. So the focus is on Peninsula High School today. But you did play PV uh, about a week or so ago. Uh, and I believe you play them next week as well for your second match, yep. correct? Yeah, we And that's kind of, and I touch on that because you mentioned it's not all about one player. You could have a great player, but because yeah. in that match against Palos Verdes, I believe your number one seeded player for that, for that day won their match, but you didn't win the overall match against them, correct? Right. Yeah. No, we actually got destroyed. <laughs> no, they beat us. Uh, they beat us 15-3, and they have a real, really great team. And Kurt is, and Wade, they've done a really nice job with them. They have a lot of new players, uh, young players, um, and usually it takes a while to develop those freshmen mm -hmm. uh, into doubles players. So in tennis, you need three singles players and six doubles players. Uh, so I wasn't counting on their freshman girls being really good doubles players, and, mm -hmm. and they were. So, um, yeah, they, they beat us handily. And, um, you know, so we, we have another crack at them, but it's going to be a tall order. Yeah. Um, and, and, and one of the challenges as a coach in tennis, mm -hmm. other than, say, other sports, is that because this it's a team sport, but yet the individual aspect of things can change the dynamic for you as a coach if a girl happens to be out on tour or mm -hmm. out, uh, you know, with something that's personal for that. So you need to maybe juggle your lineup more than, say, other team sports may have to. Is that true? And how do you deal with that? It is true. And yeah. we, we discuss this a lot when other coaches at the high school say, wait, you were missing one of your players? Well, tell your player to get there. Exactly. And it, well, our girl is playing in the Philippines in, right. a, in a big tournament. And other, you know, the football team, the basketball team doesn't have players that are running off. And in tennis, you need to get a ranking. You need to get a high UTR and to move on to college. Yeah. And so you can't deny the girls that are really good. Right. I mean, we started the season with one of our top players at the U.S. Open. Right. And so, um, but we, we're always explaining this to football and basketball coaches because they're all like, get your team all in one place at the same time. It's different than it used to yeah. be and at further sports. So the, you know, the good thing is that when this thing will air, you will have played Palos Verdes the second time. So anything you say here today, they're, they're not going to hear it before they play you. But so tell us, you know, give them a sense back at home how, how you deal with your team after having lost that match, knowing you get another shot at them, and maybe some of these other players coming back that you didn't have, you know, how, what kind of tweaks are you planning to make, and how do you talk to the, the squad about just the defeat and how you want to approach things next time? Well, you do have to have a frank discussion because we, the first discussion is, can we beat them with the same lineup, just play better, uh, smarter? And I think they all agreed. No, we have to try some new doubles combinations, uh, maybe even put some of our singles girls into doubles. We, we have to try something. Uh, if we had lost 10-8, then it would have been a different discussion, but, uh, but it wasn't close. So I think uh, getting the girls to agree that we need to make some changes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's risky because it could just collapse on us if we make too many changes. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to figure out who, who can maybe just up their game a little bit and who uh, works better with a different person. Um, 
But I think, um, back to your earlier question, if you compare tennis today with, and other sports today with 20 years ago, so many girls at PV High and at Peninsula are very academic minded and they're doing a lot of extracurricular things. I think in the years past, you would just say, make a choice. But now kids want to do everything. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they feel like colleges want that on their resume, that they're in MUN and speech and debate. Mm -hmm. And, right. and uh, so there's a lot more conflicts, I think, than just the tennis conflict. Um, so mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of juggling that constantly. Uh, and the communication has to be open uh, with them. Um, so, I don't know, don't you think? Definitely. Yeah. And um, they're good students. I mean, tennis players, um, you know, can really focus in the classroom. So yeah. we're, we're really always juggling mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So and they, we want to keep those girls active and right. being involved in a lot of things. Yeah. And is there anything in your mind that you're really focusing on this next match with PV yourself, Barbara, as you think about maybe some of the changes you might want to do? Well, you know, when you're talking about changes you're going to make for your team, Mike, PV is thinking, do they need to make any changes? Right. And they're trying to guess what changes we're making. I mean, <laughs> it's a chess know, match. It, yeah. it is a little chess well. match. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes we get, you know, you submit the lineup separately, and then you get really excited when you get to open it up and right. see what, how they moved people right. and how we moved people. Yeah. And, and again, going back to the, just the coach's perspective on things, when you coach a program for as long as you have, you've been 24 years there, 12 years, and then you've got Coach Ikeo there at PV for a, a long time. Yeah. You know each other's style as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe you... you do you feel like you kind of have a sense, not just from PV, but from the other schools in the Bay League with coaches that have been there a long time, where you got a good feel for what they may do when you do play them? Because tell me, I don't know, uh, other sports like football, they have film. They can watch film, right. right? I don't know if you watch film, whether you tape yourselves or you get anything from uh, scouting stuff, but talk about that too. Yeah. Our girls know the players from other schools because they play them on the weekends in tournaments. So there's a lot of discussion we have with our current players, right? I mean, right. that's what we always ask. Who knows someone on mm -hmm. the Corona Del Mar? And they usually get the inside scoop. Okay. Yeah, it, it helps more with the schools um, uh, that are non-league because we may not know them as well, but we, we know the Miracosta players really well, the Redondo players, the PV uh, someone like Wade at, at, at PV, he, um, he's at the Kramer Club too, and he knows all the girls because girls on both teams are, are playing there and practicing there. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think um, it, that isn't as much of a surprise to us because the girls can really help us out. Um, they, they know their players. So we're not watching film, but they'll say, oh, I played her three weeks ago in a tournament in the second round, and then they'll stop and I'll say, who won? I need to know who won. <laughs> Don't stop there. So, yeah, oh, she won. Okay, well, do you think you can beat her this time? Uh, maybe, you know, he's just like, uh, so you got to figure it out, yeah. Okay, so it's October 21st today. Uh, we're in middle of league play. Tell us how your standing is currently in the Bay League and how you anticipate things may be unfolding for your team and, and the league in general. If there is a, a team that you think you, know, you need to target and where you see yourself ending up at the end of, going into playoffs at the end this of the Bay. You. This is me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, Division One has 41 teams and they take the top eight and create an open division um, and then, so Division One is actually the ninth best team through 41. Um, so right now, Palos Verdes is ranked fourth, and we are ranked sixth. And so we both look to be in the open division. They will peel us off. The top eight, they'll peel off. Um, so the rest um, of the Bay League is there anyone uh, else uh, ab above you? No, ranking wise. No, okay. there isn't. Um, okay. Redondo and Miracosta are both Division One teams, and they will be in the actual Division One. Um, and then Culver City and Santa Monica are also in our league, but they're not in Division okay. One. Okay. All right. Um, 
So we, uh, our, our one loss is to Palos Verdes, and we have, um, we've swept the other teams uh, fairly easily. Um, so this year, it's a two-team race. Right. Uh, okay. Miracosta is often very competitive with us, but they're in a rebuilding year this mm -hmm. year. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's been uh, a clear one and two. Um, we play a tough non-league schedule. I think this is actually a philosophy that Barb has always mm -hmm. had about mm -hmm. um, having, playing the best competition. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that competitive. Yeah, I think I've heard, you know, with other sports too, if you have high expectations like you do, it's nice to play really challenging teams before league to yes. kind of prep you for that because you, have, you want to win right. league and you want to go on and be successful at CIF, so yeah. Yeah, right, so we play a really tough schedule. I mean, we, we travel, we play San Marino, and we play University, and we play the Beckman Tournament in, South, in Orange County, which has so many tennis players right now. And we just want to see them all and play against them early. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and some of the time we play some of the toughest teams in late August when we're just, just starting. And so by the time playoffs come, we say, you know, we're better now than we were when we played them. Um, yeah. But we got to play them. Right. So yeah. there's other teams that don't play a tough schedule and we want, we, we don't want to do that. Yeah. We want to see them before we go into playoffs. And then that comes, I, I was thinking you were gonna talk about maybe Pete Carroll and what he told us one time. Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> Well, he, uh, he just talked about how his practices are um, competitive. Uh, he plays a lot of games. And the players, when he was at USC, they'd like to see that. They like to see who's winning the little mini games because then your focus gets better. And so a lot of our players play tournaments, and then they're tournament tough. But some of our other players, they stroke the ball very well, but you just don't know how they'll do under pressure. So uh, that's something that Barb took to heart. In our mm -hmm. practices, mm -hmm. we try to create a lot of pressure situations mm -hmm. um, so that the, our girls can come through when we need them. Right. right, and we always kind of say conditioning, you've got to do that on your own. We don't have that much time. We don't have that many extra mm -hmm. tennis courts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We don't have lights on our courts. So if it gets right. dark, we're done. So we really, we don't want the kids to just be stroking mm -hmm. because we, we always remind the kids in warm up in tennis, everyone looks great because you're just loose and you're just, but then when it gets in the match and then you get the pressure, right. um, some kids yeah. are not, that's where it really shows. So we're always playing games. What's the score? What's the score is what we're right. always asking the right. kids right. in practice. You know, one thing I observed when I watched the uh, Palos Verdes match that you had is in the doubles, uh, you had two girls playing together where one I believe um, was lefty. Mm -hmm. True, do you have a left, yes, right, and yeah. then another righty. And I notice, again, and I'm a novice tennis player, I don't have experience like you by any means. So but what I observed was, compared to the other doubles, either on your team or as PV High's team, is your girls that whole time that I saw them playing were playing at the baseline. Yeah. Was that a strategic thing? Was that uh, because one is lefty, one is righty, it worked out better for that? Because I've seen other types of things where now you'll see in doubles, You'll have, I don't know, and you tell me what they call it, where a girl will be at the net, maybe like kind of hanging low, where you don't know where she's going to go, right or left, right? Right. So talk about, because uh, I know doubles is an important part of the match, you know, scoring and, and so forth. So yeah. can you touch on that? Well, doubles is one at the net. Um, so you need a strong doubles player. However, if you have a baseline player who's maybe more of a counter puncher, um, sometimes they can be effective against doubles players. Uh, when you play both back, the volleyers often don't know where to hit the ball. When you're one up, one back, they have a place to, to mm -hmm. hit it. So uh, w I think the, the match you were talking about, we had one girl who doesn't volley as well. And so we could put her up at the net, but she's probably going to miss. Mm. Um, and that's where... It, so you're playing to their strengths, playing, as you should, yeah, right? Yeah, playing to okay. their strengths, right. Um, but you just have to, you have to make some adjustments. Um, they, the, the Palos Verdes girls, <laughs> volleyed so well that, that that strategy didn't work. So we're going to have to try a different strategy with right. that team. 
Sure. Yeah. I'm Joe Alessi. I am a broker associate with Remax Estate Properties. So the beauty of our industry is consumers have choices all over the place. What they don't know when it comes to real estate is what to really look for. And so things that they should think about is looking for someone that will do the little things. I will lose a deal before I allow someone to do something that's not going to benefit them. I've been with Remax Estate Properties about 11 years now. The clientele I work with can be very vast from someone buying their first home, of course, to someone upsizing their home. It could be a lot of different things that they're looking for. A lot of people love to say they go the extra mile. You'll hear that all the time. I am not afraid to get my hands dirty around the house and under the house, go into an electrical panel myself or climb on somebody's roof. It could be anywhere. I tend to become friends with many of the people I work with. This is not a one and done type of business. This is a lifelong relationship once it starts. And let's delve into that. We talked a little bit earlier. So this is the girls tennis team. This is the first time I've had a woman and a man as the coach. Mm -hmm. And I love, and, and for those out there that don't know, you are married, so you have that nice yeah. extra bond that maybe some other coaches may not have where you maybe know what others, the other person's thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. and, right. and your own strengths and weaknesses as coaches, right? So I'm sure you maybe look to the other person to handle certain things because of that. But, so talk about that in general. Plus, do you feel like because these are girl athletes that you as a woman or as a man are able to see things maybe a little bit differently than another coach if it was just all women coaches or all men coaches. Can you just touch on that topic in general? Hmm. I think we decided think? Uh, that we needed to be co-coaches four or five years ago just because of that fact that uh, coaching women, I think there needs to be more women coaches mm -hmm. coaching women. Uh, so. She was doing the JV team and I was doing the varsity and we just decided we're going to be co-head coaches. So, for instance, yesterday I coached the JV team against Redondo. So sometimes we have to flip and other times we're both there at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely we bring different strengths. I think, uh, you know, I don't think we realized that this was actually going to be a better dynamic. Uh, I think we are thinking more, it's just, it's better for women to have, uh, girls to have a woman coach. Um, so I don't know, it's hard to get into, into personal. It's, yeah, not it's, personal, it's, but you know, again, yeah. regardless of it being tennis yeah. or any, any sport really, you know, you do have more women in sports right. and women coaches now, which is fantastic. You're even seeing yeah. in the NFL now, women referees, right? right. So it's fantastic. If you're yeah. qualified to do the job, does, right. you, gender doesn't matter. But I mean, just as a man, I would think if I was coaching girls of any yeah. age or any sport, there was things that I wouldn't be able to relate to them as much. So I mean, I would think you'd maybe have an edge on any male coach, you know, yeah. so just kind of touch on that because I would think that, you know, there's some sense that oh, as I a know, woman I know that, that you just, have. Um, you know, I retired from teaching uh, last year, but when we were both on campus, the girls would go to her room at lunch to talk about things. They wouldn't really come to my room. Right. Yeah. So there <laughs> and, might be a comfort level. Uh, yeah, I think that the they have. Level, yeah, and I'm yeah. really aware that I played high school a long time ago, but there are situations that happen on the court where you know, girls get emotional or they're feeling mm -hmm. something that I, I can remember, you know, this is, this is what, you know, this would help you get some confidence because a lot of it is confidence. You need to control your court. And so I'm always telling the girls, you finish your warm up first and then you tell the other team, I'm ready, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and try to get there early and get set up. I just remember a lot of the time when you're competing, you want, even if you don't feel confident, you've got to look confident, you know, you've got to act confident. And I think that's harder for, for girls 
in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, our tennis team, we kind of joke in practice. Of course, they're practicing with their friends, but there's a lot of hitting shots saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, as they hit an overhead or something. You know, you don't need to say sorry. You just, that was an awesome shot. Right. But where the guys don't say sorry as much, you know? <laughs> right. And you don't, you don't need to say sorry when you just won. <laughs> right. And that's something that, you know, since you played in high school yourself, correct? Yes. So, because in, in general, my observation as it, when I was a high school athlete myself, compared to today's game in all sports, the compassion levels were different. Mm -hmm. Coaches were a little bit more hard-headed, right? Yep. It was all about results, right? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Since you played as a high school athlete, when you were being coached, were you, do you see a big difference in the game then and now between just, you know, how coaches make demands and, and want results and You know, I feel like I, I come from um, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, so it's really hard for me to separate Sheboygan, Wisconsin from Palos Verdes right. tennis. Is, right. is they're different worlds, right. really. They're different worlds. Okay. Okay. So. But I, I do think tennis in general is a very lonely sport. And you have to know the girls when you think you need to go out there and talk to them and when, when you don't need to go. Sometimes you see something and you sense that she doesn't really like talking at the crossover. She's really focused now. Don't bother her. And other girls, right. they want you out there every crossover just because they like to talk and that's their way right. of dealing with it. Uh, it may not be anything strategic. And I do think she senses that maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more than I do. Okay. I, I'm looking and saying, I've got to tell her that she's not hitting her backhand right. And she might think, I've got to tell her, just take a deep breath and slow down and, you know, maybe more psychological. Yeah, yeah and that makes me think of, too, again, um, the other element that you may have to deal with on a different level than other sports is the parent. Yeah. And there's been well-documented cases Jennifer Capriati, right, and her father and how she felt and how that impacted her and her career. I know tennis players from when I was a kid that their parents were very, you know, demanding on them. And then as soon as they were off to college, you know, things changed. We're now they're their own person and, you know, lifestyle changes. Um, so I, do you find that that's a challenge for you as a coach. You have to really think about how that parent is interacting with any of your athletes and how you then have to dance around that. Is that something that you deal with a lot? There is some dancing. <laughs> <laughs> a little soft shoe or tap? What are we talking about? Yeah, well, you know, it is a, also more of a unique sport because the parents and the spectators are right down there with the coaches on the sidelines. So there's no basketball, football separation. Maybe they right. can hear them yelling from the stands, but they're not right down on the sideline with you. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, um, but I think if you just uh, establish a good relationship with the parents um, and... Uh, for a while, I was a little worried about private coaches coming around and wanting you to, to talk to their player and say this and say that, but they're usually really good mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. All the, the local pros are, are very good about that. They understand that you've got the team and you're the coach and they've got the, the person on the weekend mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think it's something we're just kind of comfortable with now. Um, but I, I do think you're right about that. Um, there are some parents that, um, that see their daughter as a pro, um, right. you know, at an early age, and um, maybe we don't quite see them as a pro, uh, as, a, as, a, as just right. a good player, so, right. yeah. Yeah, and, that's, and that goes back to being a coach. This is, I mean, yes, you do have girls that have aspirations and talent to play at other levels, but more so, more important than that is, you know, you're forming a young woman into an adult, right? And you're there, you're not just teaching the forehand and the backhand, right? You're, right. you're talking about life in general. Uh, and so, yeah, you have to blend the two together, right? Yeah, that's right. 
Right, and it's it is um, a team, so you can have the superstars, but but they're fitting their puzzles into the team. So you have to try to explain. You might we need you to play doubles today, even though singles is what you really want. We're trying to win this match, and the girls have to kind of buy into. It's not, they don't always get to do exactly what they want. But the benefits of the team, I think, they, they buy into that right away. We have sweet girls and fun bus rides and good food and a lot of cheering and cute outfits. And, you know, they, right. they get the whole, and, and team spirit. Right. And um, it's nice to be part of something on mm -hmm. campus. So mm -hmm. they, get it, they get that. Yeah. But you're right, Mike. I mean, there's, a, there's an intimacy with this game that yeah. you don't get in other sports where the courts are right there, the parents, because yeah. again, going back to that match with Palos Verdes, yeah. I saw some parents who you could sense where the, the, the girl <laughs> would feel the parent there if they yeah. weren't playing well, and then the parent might come around and yeah. try to get in their ear, and they want to mm -hmm. focus. So that, I know that's, that could be yeah. a, a challenging yeah. part of what you do for sure. Yeah. You know, being a realtor, again, this is why we're kind of talking about just mm -hmm. to get into the community. This is the kind of the first sport that I could talk about where people will actually move to the peninsula to get into your program. Yes. Right? I mean, we're talking about homes with tennis courts, all of that that they look right. for. And then a lot of these families are, you know, uh, higher echelon in the, in the income world. So they come here for the schools specifically. Do you ever get parents reaching out to you while they're talking about or thinking about making that kind of move? Do you ever have to deal with that? Not too often. We usually just hear about it and someone will tell us, oh, did you hear this family moved in? Um, you know, I think we, are, we have four kids ourselves and they're grown up now, but when they were younger, we were kind of more in the know because they played tennis too. And uh, so we would go to the tournaments and we would see players and we were a little more involved. Now I think we're, we don't quite have the, the gossipy element. <laughs> we're not quite as involved in that, wouldn't you say? I would say that's true. Yeah. So they're not consulting you. They're not coming to you ahead of time and saying, no. hey, you know, we're... we're we're coming from Australia and yeah. you know, we're thinking about coming here and so you're not seeing a lot of that? Well, we're, there's kind of a contact rule. Um, so you, they, uh, usually if someone does email us, we send the email to our athletic director and, okay. and he'll just say, well, he'll, he'll talk to you. Uh, but sometimes the counselors will tell us, oh, I, you know, I heard there's someone that, someone just enrolled today. And as soon as that happens, then <laughs> I need to get on the phone because they are enrolled and say, welcome, you know. But they also moved yeah. to the peninsula and we're not sure which high school. Right, they're and that's the thing. So to. you're yeah. hoping so to we're, make we're, your we're, pitch yes. and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you can't make a pitch before, okay. yeah. You can't make a pitch. And yeah. then the high schools are different you know, in, in academic ways, they set up different programs, Latin in one, and, you know, different programs in each one. So yeah. they did that on purpose to keep them. Block right. schedule versus Block, Yes, a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you can't, um, you can't say you should come to our school because maybe they're interested in television and that is, you know, PV High has more of that right. studio. But back so. to our original thought that we have 60 girls in the program and there just are so many that are taking lessons and are really fanatical about being on the tennis team then that's why we try not to cut too much um, because we want to serve the community there's just a lot of tennis players right. in the community yeah Earlier, we touched a little bit on the technology of the game, and obviously the court size has been the same forever. Yeah. We know the racket has changed over those years. I remember as a kid, you know, watching, you know, Navratilova and Chris Everett and all of that, and they would play with the wooden racket. Um, the tennis ball is what it is, although I did read that I think there's about 350 million tennis balls Oh, really? produced every year. So I think the ball has changed a little bit because they want to make it last a little longer for the environment. Yeah. So that they're not just going back and forth. Maybe they have a little longer life. But can you talk, and you have a great tennis racket collection, I understand. Uh, so feel free to touch on that. Um, but talk about how the technology may have changed, uh, you know, how the game is played for these girls. And because I've also heard that some of the way that some of these rackets are woven, um, 
might put more strain on their arm. So just talk about you know, some of those different things that you're seeing with your athletes based on how the, the racket has changed in the ball. You're good with that. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> you can start. Yeah, um, well, uh, the rackets now, you can hit the ball so much harder with the racket. And uh, there's a heavier emphasis on top spin. So the top spin brings the ball down. Um, so the pace of the game is just faster. Um, and I guess what has been lost maybe is a little finesse. Um, and so I'm an old school, gr grew up with a wooden racket, and I was a little craftier uh, with drop shots and a variety of shots. Um, so I, I think a lot of that is coming back. Uh, you see that in the pros. Uh, the pros are doing more drop shots. Um, they're serving volleying, which was a, kind of an old school thing. For a while, you wouldn't serve and volley with the new rackets because um, you would hit a hard serve, but that would get to them faster and get back to you faster, and you couldn't get as close to the net. Back in the wooden racket days, you could hit a little spin serve and get really tight on the net. Um, so, but I see more players are serving and volleying again, and um, that's a good thing. You have uh, more variety of players, but uh, even for an old timer like me, picking up a new racket, it just feels so great. Like, oh, why didn't we have this when I was a kid? <laughs> I have a lot so. of the old rackets in my, my classroom, and once in a while we bring them to the courts just to see what it would feel right. like yeah. to hit with some of these old rackets. And yeah. That's it's, interesting. Yeah. And you really had to hit the sweet spot. When they you, talk about the yeah. sweet spot, with a, a new racket, you really don't have to hit the sweet spot. It'll mm -hmm. be just as good up a little high or down a little low. Yeah, Barbara, you were not there when I went to the practice, but uh, in the middle of practice when he had a little break, I said, hey, can you have one of your athletes serve to me, right? Get him out of tennis player. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm Most coming in, and I'll listen, I'm coming in cold, that's my excuse, but, yeah. you know, she served to me, I, I couldn't even get the racket on the ball. Yeah. It comes so fast. It comes quickly, yeah. you know, and that's the thing about, you know, again, that, uh, w when you watch a sport, it could be any sport. You watch people that surf, you watch this, you think, oh, they make it look so easy. Yeah. You think, oh, how come they couldn't get, oh, and then you say, to yourself, how come they couldn't get to that ball? It looked like, you know, right? But when you're, when you're there, I mean, this, like, and that's why I wanted to get out there, just to kind of see it for myself, even though I know it. Yeah. But these are really high, highly trained athletes, and it's a difficult sport. It's and not they, easy. And then you're right, they make it look easy. Right. I mean, we, we sometimes have our students come out and our, our athletes will serve to them because, you know, they'll, it's girls' tennis. Right. They, and they'll oh, think, yeah. oh, I can get this back. And you right. get, I said, you gotta be careful. This is gonna, might be dangerous because right. the serve is coming. And they usually do get surprised how fast the serves are coming. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was an excellent discussion. I loved it. And one of the things I also, recall from watching you at practice and how you were talking with the girls is you had a quote for them and it sounded like you have an English background, mm -hmm. I believe as a teacher. Yes, and yes. so do you have a quote that you would like to leave us with today? Well, I guess before a quote, I just would like to say that uh, we've talked a lot about winning, um, but it's really a joy to be out with the girls uh, post COVID, we're not really post COVID, um, but they did suffer for a couple of years. Uh, that was really tough on them. And now I think the fun of being on a team, socializing, uh, rooting for each other, uh, you can see the joy back in their, their faces. Mm -hmm. And that's really been good, I think, this year, more than the other years where we've been wearing masks and we couldn't ride the bus. And, you know, it, there was just the last two years that really took the joy out of, yeah. out of the sport. And you can really sense that with the girls uh, this year. Uh, it really feels great just to be around them. Yeah, psychologically, them. mentally for these kids, whether right. you play a sport or not, just in, in, yeah. you know, yeah. at that young age. But. Yeah, but I guess the quote I used when you came to practice was, um, because we've had an up and down year, we, we, uh, we won CIF two years, three years ago, and then we won it again. Last year, we were trying to three-peat, and we lost in the finals. Uh, so we've always been really solid, but this year, we've just had good and bad days. So I wanted to tell them that 
a quote that I like, and that is, if where there is no strife, there is decay. The mixture which is not shaken decomposes. And so we had a little discussion what that meant, and that was fun to hear, hear that. But I think they understood that, uh, you know, sometimes a little, little stress is good for you. Right. And when you made the quote, or when you gave it, you asked them what they thought of it. Yes, you were looking for right. feedback. You treated it like a classroom. Yes. And you were saying, hey, well, what, is, what are yeah. you getting from that? So it was nice. You had some nice back and forth. And who was that quote from? Heraclitus. A Greek right. philosopher. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you again, and thank you for tuning in. And please tune into all of our PVPN shows, and please subscribe below if you're having a good time. And thank you for coming today. <laughs>